thank you for having me. And I'm happy to already see some Dutch influence around here in the harbor, uh, the bridge building. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank you for having uh, me. Uh, we, Stipo, uh, are also based in Stockholm. Uh, we've also, uh, well, gotten to know Pertel through this. Uh, and I'm based in Rotterdam at the moment. Um, my name is René. Um, and I'm an urban anthropologist, um, yeah, visiting places like this and always on field work, basically, for my work. Um, I wanted to, previous to this, this visit, I wanted to learn a little bit more about how, how in Estonian place and, and the sense of place is uh, translated. And um, with the help of some of the organizers, uh, we came to Sin on Minu Kot, if I say that correct. Um, and I was really uh, uh, happy to hear, uh, to talk about this. And I think one of the things that we do as, uh, as Tipo, but also me, myself, um, placemaking, uh, urban development, it's all about people. It should be for people. And I think also that's why it's about the conversation. What does place mean to us? Uh, so this is something I'm weaving into my presentation. Shortly about STIPO, what we do, um, we really work a lot on public space, making this more attractive uh, for everybody involved. Um, social innovation comes with that basically, uh, um, yeah, without question, because we need to see how to govern public space, but also kind of reteach people how to use public space. Uh, oh, sorry, that was a bit too quick. Um, Besides that, we also organize sustainable transformation, which sometimes means complete new areas or, for example, old business uh, uh, spaces where there's no more, uh, no more use and, and we redesign the space. And on the, uh, well, on the long side, uh, besides all the projects that we do on the ground, we, we focus on new visions, concepts, and, and yeah, develop new strategies for public space, mostly. Uh, some of the things that are really important to us, um, we started as a, a sort of a side project at the University of Amsterdam uh, a long time ago um, and started focusing more as a consultancy uh, on long-lasting quality of spaces. The soul of the place is one of our few core uh, principles, so these are also actually our principles that we always try to work on in all of our projects. Um, because public space is about people, it's the soul of the place, it tells you a story, it, it is history, it is nowadays use, uh, these are all things mixed together. Also the use should be mixed and diverse, it shouldn't be one thing only. Um, and I think what you're facing here in the harbor, it shouldn't be just the people that take the ferry, They're, everybody should use this space. Um, public quality comes with that as well. And ownership, uh, that's some of the... Well, the harder things, because ownership is not only about who owns the building or who, or who owns the space, it's also about feeling of ownership and how can you create that um, through placemaking. Um, and also the city at eye level, those are the two things that we try to use in our processes. Um, we are, I'll tell you a little bit later about our team, but we are based in Stockholm, but also in Rotterdam and Thessaloniki and Amsterdam, and we've started working in many countries at the moment to, uh, yeah, to see also what this means in different cultures. Uh, this is our team. It's a very uh, interdisciplinary team. Uh, we have sociologists, we have heritage specialists, we have a, a, um, an urban psychologist. Um, and we think this is needed because cities are about people and we need all the perspectives uh, possible. I think one of the reasons why we were also, uh, uh, yeah, so kind of coming together here, also with Ramon as another uh, international speaker, we've been trying to in interact with as many people as possible in Europe that are working on public space, um, yeah, projects, uh, both from the municipality, from the government, but also from bottom-up initiatives. Usually, we find that these people are re working really hard within their uh, within their own institutions, uh, but they don't really have the connection to other people. So this is why we started the European Placemaking Network, and this has been f well up to now. It's been going on for about a year now, and it's been super great to see that people get so much energy out of connecting, learning lessons together. We organized a conference in Stockholm uh, last spring, and we will be. Uh, going to Valencia next year. Maybe Tallinn could be on the, some of the next <laughs> destinations. Uh, and the thing is that these gatherings, a bit like the City Forum as well, they host conversations, but also 
we hope to spark actual impact right away. And I think this is also something that, um, um, well, you can hope for the, the harbor as well in the, in the end. From space to place, I'll tell you a little bit about how we tried to implement some of the theories that have already been going on for ages. Um, William White is one of our godfathers. Um, what he used to do, he used to stand on rooftops. Um, not because he designed rooftops or wanted to have the, the bird's eye view, which usually architects have uh, if you think about the city design. He stood there to analyze public space use. How were people moving through the space? How, were people, how long were people sitting on this one bench that was uh, uh, standing in the, in the street? And through this, he based basically a lot of theories on, on very, well, very needed evidence to, to understand how we use public space. Jane Jacobs is one of the other people that uh, inspires us because she is really looking at how people actually improve public space. We need people to feel safe. We need people to be ourselves and to uh, feel free to do whatever we want to do. I think also Ramon mentioned this, that we need lovers in public space. That is a sign of good public space. And uh, besides these theories, uh, we also want to work on the, the, well, the nowadays examples. So uh, through the city at eye level, which is a program that we started, we are trying to capture as many as possible good examples, also bad examples, mistakes. We make mistakes. We need to learn from each other. Uh, and these are now turning into books. Um, one of the ones we focused on plinths. Uh, I think it was Andrik mentioning the, the glass plinths that are very sort of, uh, well, un, unwelcoming for people to, to use. And these are some of the lessons that we take, uh, take in these books as well. And also we focused one on Holland exactly, because in the Netherlands we also have a lot of good examples and a lot of bad examples. And it brings people together also, these books and these uh, ways of sharing. Um, you would think that it's hard to create a space that is not attractive to people. And I think we're all, especially this group of people, we're all working hard to, to create spaces that are for people. Somehow it is happening more than ever or more than, uh, than just a couple times. We create spaces that people feel lost in. Either they're too big or they are not accessible or they don't feel open. Um, same as if you design for cars you will get cars. Um, there's a lot of parking lots around here, and there's a lot of parking lots not in use, or at least not always. Um, so these are things you need to really work with in a different way. Um, this is one of the places that we work in as well in a coastal town in Holland at the moment. They have a lot of problems in the summer. In the winter, it's kind of deserted. This is what happens when there's a place for all the scooters to park. Uh, there's no way you can see the ocean, even though it's right there. Um, you get dangerous situations. It's hard for kids to move around by themselves on bikes. Um, well, the elderly ladies have trouble crossing the streets. Yet, if you design for people, you will get people. And uh, this is one of the places in, in Paris where usually this is, a, this is a highway, this is where cars move through. Now it's Paris Plage, it's where people stay. And they don't stay for just a couple minutes to sit on a bench, they'll stay here for as long as they, uh, they can. I was very happy that uh, somebody mentioned benches already. Um, I think a couple people actually did, which I'm very happy about. We are kind of obsessed with benches. <laughs> our, uh, our team app is always full of pictures with benches and uh, how they are used. Um, and well, th this is just a couple examples to show that benches are, I mean, they're so important in public space, but they're so bad often. Um, so these are a couple examples. The example here above, you can see these benches are very long, kind of strange. They probably look very good in pictures. Uh, but as you can see, these people could have sit on the same bench, but they don't because it's, it's too long and, and doesn't feel nice. Although here below, you can see people are sitting really close, interacting, everything's, all kinds of things are happening. Um, we already did some exploring the last couple of days when we were here. And um, here again, you can see there's benches, but at the moment, maybe it's too cold, but nobody's using them. Uh, and even the benches in the pictures, nobody's using them. There's nobody sitting in the picture even. Um, yeah, another one where there's 
sort of the size of the bench matters. We have, we're doing whole studies about what the perfect bench is. We are not done yet, so we will <laughs> let you know. But um, here above, people are, are sitting together, while below, people are actually putting stuff next to them. This guy is even more extreme. He put chairs on the bench <laughs> to make sure that nobody would sit next to him. That's uh, one of these examples that I always think is very interesting to see. Here we have a complete different situation, basically through the design of the bench. Um, it's a waterfront area. It's also, uh, well, public space. There's not even really a cafe or something happening. There's just a bench that is designed for multiple people to use. Uh, there's people cuddling as uh, we need lovers in public space. You need to feel free to do that. There's a group of girls talking about who knows what. There's a woman pretending to do her nails, probably listening to the stories in the back. Uh, this is what you want in public space. You want everybody to, to be able to mingle. And walking around here, I found some benches that were kind of poorly, um, yeah, they were poorly used, but also if you look at it, there's a fence. What do you see when you sit on these benches? And I mean, this is just, you know, as an anthropologist, this is what I do. I look around, this is what I see. Uh, and it's, it's really great if you have benches they can be moved. We can move them elsewhere. We can look outside and see where we can move them uh, in the workshops later this week. Um, I put together a couple of uh, um, yeah, reasons why I think placemaking could be used here in the port. Um, creating something before it's actually there. There will be a lot of development taking place over the next, well, what, 10, 20 years. Um, and something that is a really great example of, of how to draw people here before actually the final result is there. Um, this is uh, an example from a, a recent development in Amsterdam, which is Eiberg, all the way there on the, I don't know, this doesn't have a pointer probably. Um, actually, I'll walk there. It's all the way over here, what I'll be talking about. And as you can see, the city center is here. So nobody, nobody would really t take the effort to drive all the way out there on their bikes. It's like a windy bridge, and it's all the way out there. And it was in development, so nobody was thinking about going there because it didn't have a destination. Far, far in the back, um, somebody said, you know what, in the meantime, can I open up a beach club there? And everybody's, you're crazy, go ahead, you know, whatever. There's a sandy area, uh, Amsterdam doesn't have a beach. Um, so this person was thinking, you know what, I'm gonna try. Of course, people were in the beginning a little bit hesitant and not really sure what would <laughs> happen in this faraway place where you would have to bike all the way. Um, I think trams were not even going there at that point. But it turned out into something really big. And uh, suddenly, everybody was talking about it. And people wanted to go there. And big festivals were hosted. And it became a place, even though the rest of around it was still in development. And actually, this also attracted people that weren't thinking about living in this place, because it was so far away from everything. Uh, but now, it also drew people that wanted to live here. So that's something you want to create here as well. You want to create this buzz where people want to be a part of. Um, yeah, this is a topic, um, and I know that uh, the different areas are not all owned by the port. Uh, there's, of course, a mixture of, of ownership here. Uh, but walking around, I found the Lina Hall is such a beautiful place, and it is just in the vicinity. It's, it's the context. Um, and I think this is one of these places that you could show if you take care of these places, or at least give them some kind of you know, new use, then you could better the whole area. Um, and this is just to show kind of, I think also Ramon mentioned a bit about the financial side of placemaking. It is about changing, changing the loop instead of the downward spiral where, yeah, okay, it's not in use. Oh, okay, well, it's, it's, it's going to be worth less. Uh, it's going to be harder to, to renovate, all these things. Um, to create use, and it can, be, it can be super simple. It could even be creating a, a, a spot where you can take really cool Instagram photos. It's just like a very simple thing. People will go there and it will somehow create a buzz. Um, another one, ownership creates sustainable cities. Uh, this is, again, not about who owns this, this plot of land, but it's about feeling sense of place. Um, this is one of the areas in Rotterdam that's close to our office that was completely deserted. Nobody wanted to go there. Um, uh, homeless people were taking over, all these things. 
And a group of people said, okay, well, can we try at least to make something happen there? And they opened up a really temporary bar, but just like the very simple two containers, um, uh, the, the cheap rent, whatever. Now it's one of the best places to go to in Rotterdam. It's these how to give people an opportunity to also create a new place that is becoming uh, uh, more of the center of your, your development. This is a, an example of one of the projects that we worked on in a, in a yeah, kind of an outskirt area of, uh, of Haarlem, one of the towns in, in Holland. Very quick, because it's, it's a long process always. Um, there is a, an empty parking lot, and the people from the municipality were not really sure what to do with it. And a couple of youngsters that were usually hanging out there, but were always sent away, came up with the idea, why can't we have a part of the rooftop, because it's always empty, and can we do something there? And through a process of, of participation and, and interaction with all the important people, the, the, uh, the business owners, the, the municipality, uh, they got together a really great plan to build a rooftop for the youngsters. And this, this developed a whole new, um, yeah, kind of coalition between people in this area caring for this place suddenly instead of it being an empty uh, parking lot. This is in front of our building where we, where we have our office in Rotterdam, which has been a really um, great sort of bottom-up development where we've carefully picked the people that could be in the offices. And actually, uh, uh, somebody, something was mentioned about sort of setting principles of how and, and with who to develop a place. It can be really helpful to, to focus on slow urbanism more than say, we need quick wins. Uh, and this way you can basically say, okay, if you want to come here, you have to also uh, um, invest a little bit in the public space, for example, or in the social structure that uh, is built around it. Um, how am I doing on time, actually? Five? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, this is really quickly to show the process of what we usually do in a project. We will come in do stakeholder interviews, do a place game, uh, which is something we'll do in a workshop as well later. Um, and then uh, things will, will start to roll. What happens is people will be interacting, municipality, citizens. Um, they will come up with new plans for, this is one of the coastal towns that we're working in. And a group of people will be formed that will take things to a new level. We did it in one in the Central Innovation District in The Hague, and somebody said, you know what, actually this is not about organizing a festival ourselves, it is about finding the right people that will organize the festival, which is all about how to, how to build momentum with people. This is another example where one woman, all the way on the down uh, below right, she basically created this movement in an, in an area, in a an harbor area as well, where nothing was happening and she created a whole feeling around this area. And, I think looking for an identity is really important for a place like this. And what they actually did is they developed, they developed their own beer, which sounds very silly, but it's actually bringing these people that are doing all kinds of different things in this area, brings them together on a really cool social uh, level. And now all people from The Hague come to this area to drink this special beer. Um, one of the things that I heard listening to the, the different stories this morning is that it's very hard how to translate master plans to the reality and also to the in-between time. Um, I just came back from Egypt this week where we were working for a developer that is actually transforming into a government, which is very interesting, a completely different story, but this is basically what it looks like right now. They envision people everywhere. How do we get the people to the place <laughs> that we have built? Which is great, but it just it needs the social structure around it. Um, and the funny thing is, people will use the area anyways. And we've been looking around here a little bit, how people use the area. I found this very remarking. The, the woman is sitting, I don't know, this is probably open in the summer, this, uh, um, the north, north, well. Um, she was sitting there because it's out of the wind. She had a really lovely sunny spot. Uh, it's about looking at how people use the space. These people are taking pictures of their car, probably to sell it. Great, I mean, that's amazing. And this is an open space where people can do this. Um, people leave little marks. Uh, it's, a, it's a space where people can uh, express themselves. Uh, here again, a little mark. Already people are coming to this area uh, and people find their places. There's a woman here who sits here every day already. I mean, I've seen it for a couple days now. 
um, these guys are fishing in the area. I mean, these are all kinds of use that are already taking place that you should also try to embrace or see how you can somehow facilitate uh, these better. This is a lot about how we structure the way we look at places, hardware, uh, software, orgware. The hardware can usually be in place pretty okay, but this is in the master plan, things look good. But when it comes to the actual use of place, how to build coalitions between the people that are involved, um, we're staying in a hotel really close by. Why not ask the hotel owner, owner to come and, and provide things in public space, for example? Um, and then it's about, yeah, how do you organize this from the port or from the municipality? Um, this, is a, this is a way to, to do placemaking uh, in a sort of temporary way. If you look at the use here, you'll find people biking everywhere, walking everywhere, cars, I don't know, crisscross. You could experiment with how to, uh, um, yeah, basically steer people. Um, yeah, I'll actually skip this one. This is just the last couple slides. Um, I heard you talk about the connection C to the city. Um, there's people using the waterfront, but it doesn't feel really inviting. This is also a place where there's a lot of space. Could be, you know, in the temporary way, also be restructured. Um, and this is also telling stories about the, the history, and there's a little uh, a sailing story in the back. I found this one very cool because people are very curious about what's happening and you should use this also with the future developments. Create a little, you know, a little center where people can see what's happening or, or talk about the future things. And I'll, I'll finish with this one. Um, I think a place needs not one or two things to do, it needs ten things to do. And basically every little square needs then ten things to do. And I hope that in the coming days when you walk around here you will at least look at the potential, but also what is already there. I think that's very important. Um, and yeah, it's not too hard to create things that people want to do here. So let's, let's be creative about that as well. And I hope in the coming days we'll, uh, we'll come to some conclusions together. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Don't, 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 go, don't anywhere. go away. Don't, don't go, go anywhere. Okay, okay. You came all the way from Rotterdam. <laughs> yeah. uh, cool stuff. Uh, just to define plinths, plinths is the ground level exactly. where life happens yep. or doesn't. Or doesn't, yes, exactly. So that's what you meant by plinths. So it's, it's the shops, the businesses, what we see when we walk. Oh, yeah, okay. that's already gone. Yeah, so it's basically the, the place where there was one image with the, the lines and things happening. Uh, it's basically where the, the private and the public meet. So it's also what we call the hybrid zone, is where people enter public space or they'll enter private spaces. And it's usually these places that are kind of basically... Uh, um, yeah, they, they make the space. If this is an, an uninviting uh, uh, structure or, or design, you will not feel fine in the public space itself. So it's about how to create enough entrances in, on, on a stretch that is really long, for example, or to create just enough sort of breakdown where you have a little bench outside of your store or you have some plants. And um, this is also, it has to do with life and how people feel mm -hmm. owner of their you know, you step outside of your door, you put a little plant out. This is also about how to invite owners to, to do that more. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned lighter, quicker, cheaper. That's mm -hmm. the uh, project for public spaces. Well, not a motto, but that's where it kind comes of, from. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Tactical urbanism, so mm -hmm. to say. Do stuff, just do stuff. Lighter, quicker, cheaper. Make a beer. Use that for Make a beer, content uh, marketing. Yeah, yeah, look at how people walk and, and, and create a temporary... Uh, Benches, uh, plants, stuff, just without building a new... You don't have to wait for 10 years for the no, old exactly. harbor or any sort of real estate to be ready. You can do stuff, a beach, to, from a beach to a beer. Exactly, yeah, well, that's well said. Yeah, and I think it's always about learning how to think differently. I mean, the master plan, I mean, it's there and you guys are working on it, but... It's about what can you do tomorrow and who do you want to partner up to do that tomorrow. And there's, there's people around that, can, that, can, that you can work with. Uh, with you, the Dutch, the, the great thing is that you're such friendly, warm people and there's plenty of you on a small piece of land. It's very <laughs> dense. So if you put a bench somewhere, people will probably come there, be or not, but magic will happen. People will talk. But we don't have that much people here. And those that we have are not necessarily friendly. Well, then you or should... they 
Less benches, just less, less one benches. round bench where everybody can sit that is there. <laughs> so the point and the cold, you can't escape the cold. So the point I'm trying to make warm is... Warm benches. Warm benches, there you go, <laughs> smart benches. But the point is that uh, we talked with uh, Megan Walker from, uh, from PPS uh, mm -hmm. the other week. Uh, we had a, me a meeting in Stockholm uh, about uh, a Nordic placemaking project. And the mm -hmm. challenge in the Nordic countries it is that it's cold, it's a critical mass is problem. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bench where people don't necessarily cuddle up and start talking, because there's not too many of them and, and all of that, mm -hmm. what do you do to get critical mass? And what do you do in the cold? So yeah, I've lived in uh, uh, Vancouver for the last two years and it's also cold out there. Uh, not as cold as here probably even, but... Um, so I've been working on seasonal placemaking as well on the side, which is all about how do we tackle these typical problems. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I've been seeing and, and also experiencing by doing this myself is it's not only about putting something out there, but it's also putting yourself out there. So I think you need to look for the right people that can actually activate a space. So maybe if people don't feel comfortable cuddling at first, Point Maybe those. you can, you know, sit out there with someone and at least start the conversation. And this is something that we see everywhere. People are not that hesitant to use public space as if it is their home. But if you have somebody that welcomes you, which could be through a game or with, because you want to be warm here, right? You play ping pong or something. Um, or have a little fire that will, you know, somehow uh, uh, gather people around it. And it, it's also about learning how yeah. to use public space in these in these yeah. circumstances and it's a process right it is a process for uh, sure yeah that, that was uh, uh, one of your points in in one of the slides as well that you don't need to find the right things to do but the right people to to do things with yeah exactly because you usually have these and we work in all kinds of different cities and and what we find is that you can talk to many people that are always there in all these you know the participation uh, events it's usually the same people uh, you need to find the people that are actually on the streets. These fishermen, talk to them. They know how they use their space. They would probably know what they would need, maybe a little stool or something to actually enjoy the fishing more than they do now. And this, mm -hmm. these are the people that you actually want to work with, even though they seem the people that you would normally not pick for a project. But uh, these are the experts. They know the, me the, the, the most about a space. Uh with critical mass here in the, in, in the, in the Nordics, uh, I mean, the benches still can work. What we see in, in Oslo, in Arkebrugge, the waterfront development there, still have benches and people still go there. And it's mm -hmm. as cold, as windy as here, but it's, it's still, it works. Because uh, you have different, different benches. Not, mm -hmm. no, not only the sides, but you have sort of individual bench, benches and then you have something in between where people move mm -hmm. and then right next to the cafes. So you get a different level of socialization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have all these uh, functions with benches. And uh, from, from Denmark, do you know Gate 21? It's a cluster uh, of yeah, a, a smart city and lighting. So what they are doing, they uh -huh. are building a lighting metropolis there. So what they do is they use installations they, they use lighting uh, from, from, uh, from lighting from the ceilings and streets to building a, a tiger out of light to create interesting, attractive public spaces during the cold Yeah, and I, I and guess you period. can also look at, uh, and this is the, the woman that I talked about the, that uh, developed the beer in that area. They've been looking at sort of the resources a lot in what is already happening in the area. But for example, is there any excess heat here? Create a bench around a place that is already warm from itself, and I bet with all the things that are happening here, there is a place that is warmer. Use that, and, and, and also use that as a process to get in touch with the people that you usually wouldn't get in touch with. Um, so I think there's, yeah. there's challenges, but also a lot of possibilities here. Great. Uh, is there, are there any questions from the audience? We have a question. Uh, I'll translate the question. Okay, perfect. Väinu Rajangu, minu küsimus on tingitud teie ühest slaidist. Mulle te ettekanne meeldis. Väga palju detaile, aga ühe pildi peal oli tänava sillutise muster. Kuidas mõjutab tänava sillutise muster üldse inimeste käitumist? Ja teine küsimus on, et kuidas on teie suhtumine katusaljastusse, kui näiteks autud on maal ja peal on muruplats ja nii edasi. Täna. So the gentleman liked your presentation a lot and would like to ask about the pavement. You had one slide with pavement. It had a different pattern on it. 
uh, how much does uh, the pavement patter material affect how people behave? Well, I think this way more than you think. Uh, I think it, it is one of the first things that attracts you. It's also about to know how to use a public space usually because there's sometimes there's lines or there's um, uh, direction in the pavement as well. Um, I think also the material can affect a lot how you use pavement. Um, but I don't understand about the pattern. The, it was in one of the, on the long, on the boulevard, was it that one? Yeah. This is basically just a design, but I think uh, uh, what happens, so this is really about sort of how people work. Uh, you, when you walk, you walk with five kilometers an hour. Uh, and this is our usual space. But what you see with the reflective plinths, you will walk right past and you will walk maybe two times as fast. Uh, but with these little things, such as a pattern in the pavement or a little thing outside a door or maybe something on a window or plants, movement is something that catches our eye. This is just how our body works and we will slow down and start to enjoy and kind of, you know, be curious and you'll maybe stop and, and just like dogs do, basically. They'll stop anywhere where they see something interesting. Um, so it's it's... It's using these kind of playful elements, and I mean, you see it everywhere where they, in Vancouver, they have really, really dodgy alleys in between buildings, and one of these alleys they've just turned into a bright pink basketball court, and now suddenly people want to walk through it and want to use the area, while before people weren't using it. So it's just a splash of paint, literally, um, can can completely affect how people use and and rooftops and and greenery with, with the parking spaces and and the greenery on top mm -hmm. there, that works as well. It creates attractiveness. Doesn't create any conflict between the cars going there. Well, no, usually no, no, no. I mean, they just got a space for themselves, so there's no cars anymore on so that unused space. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, this is something that you can also steer for. And I guess you might also have a more seasonal problem where there's many people in the summer. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what we see often is that it's it's harder to, to build for this flexibility um, when there's already things in place. But now with this new master plan, you could think about, OK, in summer, we might need more parking space. In winter, we might need less. We use it in the winter to build an ice skating rink or to, to, to give it to someone else to, to have a temporary food truck market or something. So it's about thinking about these things in, in, yeah, prior to you're actually uh, developing something. Cool. One more question. There's one over there. Uh, yeah, and there's a question and there's a microphone. Mm -hmm. Hi, and thank you for inspiring us and uh, showing that placemaking, in a way, is uh, renewing urban planning and why not uh, mobility as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've introduced it here uh, by urbanists and architects. It's actually stated in the Central Seaside vision as well, but it's not in the blood cycle, uh, blood circle of um, urban planning practices yet. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest? How can we inject it into the blood circle. And if you take the harbour area, I have one suggestion myself, actually, and then, <laughs> then you can answer, is that if Tallinn Harbour would want to become maybe the good public space for lovers, I love that um, mm -hmm. kind of parallel, then with all the massive developments and everything on the way here, uh, it would be a really good idea to hire kind of a uh, public space um, ambassador for lovers or something like that who will take care of that um, task. That's a lovely idea. <laughs> I think you will be the first probably in the world so that I would do that. Um, well, this is, um, this is about how to implement placemaking within uh, the organizational structures, I think. And this is something that we do a lot with municipalities. We work on how to form the best coalition to do this. And I would suggest to maybe have, besides the, the already existing structures, to have a sort of place management team who will actually focus just on what is happening in the place. What I was saying before about, you know, some, somebody that invites you into public space, you need people that are basically on the ground 24-7, or at least, you know, working hours, um, that get to know all the people that see, as William White did, see how people are actually using the space to be able to interact. 
Um, so it, it should be a new function, and you see this happening too, that there's new functions, placemakers uh, um, uh, yeah, arising within municipalities or within companies. Um, so I would, I would really give it a, a, an actual official uh, structure to, to really yeah, implement it. Yeah. Uh, the city of Uppsala in, in Sweden has done that, for example. They have mm -hmm. a placemaker. The title is, in English, placemaker. There's, is there a word for that in, in Dutch? So, yeah, this is one of the best conversations I've had with all the European members of the, the network. It's just quite, well, we, we have a, a plek, which means more than place, uh, or which means place, I guess, more than space. Um, but it's, we've... We're now struggling. We're trying to find our own word. We have stadmaker, which is more of a, like an, a city maker. Um, but I think this is a bit more on, on a higher level. So it's about these people that really are, you know, adding something to this place. None of the Scandinavian languages, Finnish or Estonian, has no, that either. No, it's hard. That's, yeah. yeah. It's good to know that. Well, I and know. I think the placemaking word, which I find now actually good, it's provoking us to actually have this conversation and yep. the fact that we're now talking about what does place mean to you and what does it mean to me, that is important. And then we can actually understand each other and help each other or, or inspire each other. Thanks very much. You're welcome. <laughs>